Hey everybody, welcome to Mailing It, the official podcast of the United States Postal Service. I'm your co-host, Dale Parsan. And I'm Yasmin DiGiulio. In this episode, we're going to talk about a symbol of the Postal Service that's become synonymous with the organization's integrity, professionalism, and ubiquity, the U.S. Postal Service uniform. For more than 150 years, the Postal Service's iconic colors of blue and cadet gray uniforms have helped the public identify mail carriers at work in our communities. Wait, Dale, the Postal Service has been around a lot longer than 150 years. Yeah, that's right, Yasmin, but postal uniforms didn't debut until after the Civil War. There's an interesting history behind that and a lot of cooler stories that tie postal uniforms to larger trends in American society throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Here to talk to us about all that is our episode's guest, Allison Bazalinski. For the past two years, Allison has been an assistant curator at the Smithsonian National Postal Museum. Allison, welcome to Mailing It. Thank you for having me. It's exciting to be here. Allison, let's start off by talking about your work at the Postal Museum. What areas do you specialize in? So my background is in material culture and American history. Um, I really specialized in sort of late 19th and early 20th century cultural history. So coming to the Postal Museum, I didn't necessarily have a background in postal history, but i um, because mail is tied to all aspects of American life, um, I've been able to sort of dig into areas that I'm interested in. And one of those areas is clothing and uniforms. Um, so um, this ties into my former research where I looked at fabric and clothing um, and how people use them um, and how they can be used to articulate identity, gender, and culture. Great. Well, given your area of expertise, we wanted to get your thoughts on why uniforms in general are so important to an organization. Uniforms in general, I think, um, really articulate a sense of identity. It's a very visual symbol um, that um, for most of the population um, is just an immediate recognition. Um, And clothing in general, um, I think, is something that most people can relate to, and it makes it a really good way to think about history and to kind of get into all these other areas because I would say the vast majority of us wear clothes every day and we have to get dressed. (laughs) Um, So um, if you think about that um, and the way we make all these snap judgments, Um, You know, it's kind of hard not to make judgments when you see someone. Um, That's how I like to think about um, clothing as a way to study history. That's interesting. And I think, you know, for the Postal Service specifically, it also sort of symbolizes that commitment to public service. These are public employees that are out here um, wearing the uniforms. And I know that the Postal Service uniforms have a lot of meaning to people across the U.S. You know, it's something that people are, are used to seeing every day just about. But it wasn't always that way, was it? No. Um, initially, um, there was no set uniform. Um, and in fact, um, people weren't um, actually getting their mail delivered to their houses. Um, you would go to your nearest post office. Um, so that might be a tavern. It might be a general store or it would be some subsection of a building. Um, and we have to remember in the early United States, most people um, weren't in cities. It was predominantly a rural nation. Um, and the other thing um, to think about is that um, prior to the mid uh, 19th century, like say 1840s, uh, mail was super expensive. So like a lot of what people were picking up were actually newspapers because newspapers were really cheap. Um, so people weren't sending as many letters until postal reforms in the 1840s. Um, so you don't even really need a letter carrier until that point in time. We've talked about that in some of our other episodes yeah. in the podcast. The, no, it's a- the taverns that house post offices. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting to to revisit that topic and and that kind of general idea of where the name came from for a letter carrier. I could imagine that uh, with businesses doubling as post offices, it, it, it they become overwhelmed at a certain point as the country as it, as it was at that time started evolving. Mail started becoming much more uh, accessible to the public. Uh, when did letter carriers start coming to people's homes? So um, we get the first um, free city delivery service. So um, all this is starting in cities where you're getting people, the postal postal carriers coming to people's homes. Um, and this um, initially starts um, in Cleveland, Ohio, um, during the Civil War. Um, Joseph Briggs, a postal employee, claimed that he thought of free of um, city free delivery during the winter of 1862 to 63, um, watching women um, looking for letters from soldiers um, and exposed to the cold while waiting in these long lines. And this is sort of an apocryphal story. But um, we do get um, an act of Congress in 1863 
that provides free city mail delivery. Um, so initially, it's 49 northern offices, um, and this is about 450 letter carriers. Um, and this is very popular very quickly. Um, and in fact, in the next five years, um, revenues from free city delivery um, are making it's over 10 times its cost. So they're making a lot of money from this. Um, and it also provides employment for um, veterans coming home from the Civil War. Um, so there's an added benefit there as well. Um, so we first see um, city letter carriers um, beginning to wear uniforms five years after it starts. Um, so in 1868 are the first uniforms. So at that time, what did the uniforms look like? Um, so it would have been fairly similar, actually, to what um, most working men, sort of middle class men, would have been wearing. Um, it's a, a sack suit. Um, so when we say that, um, it's a jacket that isn't fitted to the body. Um, and this has be sort of become the standard uniform of city men. Um, and it's there's a shift like around 1830 where prior to that, men wore very fitted clothing. Um, and then there's this shift toward the sack suit. So it's um, a coat that isn't particularly fitted. They're often made of wool. Um, and in the case of the postal uniform, um, you have this, but um, it is uh, described in great detail by the Postmaster General. So it was a single breasted, so one line of buttons, sack coat of cadet gray or blue mixed cadet cloth. So sort of between gray and blue. Um, and the way they described it, um, because you don't have stores you can go into and buy them, they use these very specific instructions. So um, the coat extended two thirds the distance from the top of the hip bone to the knee. Um, and they, they continue on um, by saying there's a pocket on each side. Um, there are flaps two and three fourths to three inches wide. Um, and then um, with pants, um, it's sort of a, a, an unfitted trouser. Um, and you um, eventually will get um, more details on that. Um, as the years go on, they add more details. Um, and in addition to pants, um, and there's also a vest. So think about like a three-piece suit, like the pants, the jacket, and the vest. Um, they also had a cape and a reversible cape. Wait, wait, wait. A, a cape? Yes. Uh, uh, is my definition of a cape different than what you're trying to say here? I'm thinking of superheroes. Um, it would have been more like a wool cape for warmth, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you think about, you know, you see people maybe in like Colonial Williamsburg or um, sort of people dressing up um, for Civil War reenactments. Um, so it'd be a cape to help with the cold. Um, and the thing is, at this time, um, men would have had to take this these specific instructions um, and the carriers at this time were men. Um, take these instructions, go to a tailor, have these made because you don't have mass produced clothing, you don't have standard sizing. Um, so, um, like for the cape, it would be wool, it'd be reversible, um, and you'd have all these different types of wool, you'd have all these different types of cloth in general. So, the, there's room for a lot of variety in these in these uniforms. I feel like with carriers having to do this on their own, was there any sort of stipend at the time to help them pay for these things? There was not. Um, you don't actually see a stipend for carriers until much later. Um, so at this time, they would have been required to pay for these out of pocket. Oh, wow. Do you know if that was a detriment to people becoming letter carriers at all? Generally, I don't think so. I haven't seen any evidence of it because it was a, such a stable job and you are getting a paycheck in ways that maybe you wouldn't get in other industries. Um, it's a good investment in your mm -hmm. career. Yes. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely an investment. Um, and you see, um, if you look through sources from the time period, um, you see even instructions from the Postmaster General to have, um, say, trousers of good quality. And they'll specify things like have them be sewn with silk thread. Um, and that's for a quality reason, because you don't want your suits to fall apart, because then you have to get them fixed, or you have to get them patched. So I'm um, the way that they're described in terms of um, the fabric and sort of the terminology they use um, has to do with um, what it would be like for the mail carriers to acquire them as well. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm very curious more about these accessories. I want to talk about hats. Uh, I feel like they've changed a lot over time. What, what can you tell us about them? Yes. Um, so uh, when postal uniforms first came into being, um, People, everyone wore hats. It's a, it was a politeness thing. Um, so um, initially, um, starting in about 1887, um, mail carriers were required to wear a hat, and they had to start pinning a badge on their hat. Um, so there are changes over time for both comfort. comfort um, so, for example, temperature or weather. Um, 
And um, we have things like the Panama hat, so a straw um, sort of flat capped hat. Um, we get safari style pith helmets um, in the 20th century. Um, and that's something that um, is also sort of, it's been used in, um, in areas of the world where it's very warm. There's sort of a colonial aspect to it. Um, so there's fashion elements sort of as well. Um, we get fur caps for winter. Um, something we have at the Postal Museum. Um, we have fur gloves as well as um, fur hats. We have some bearskin gloves there. So think about if you're up north um, or if you're in Alaska, um, you know, a fur hat might be really nice to have. Um, eventually you get um, nylon mesh caps for summer. So we start to see more casual hats. Um, and we also get um, for women um, a very short-lived beret um, that was um, considered very jaunty looking, um, although we we have one at the Postal Museum as well. Um, it's this very pretty um, red wool beret. Uh, but the woman who donated it was like, I did not enjoy wearing this. It was very hot. It never <laughs> stayed on. Um, I did not want to wear this. It was a mistake to buy it. Um, so, you know, we have we have good things and we have bad things. Um, and you don't, you know, you might see a carrier in a hat today, but you, there's no requirement for hats. Um, that went away in 1972. You mentioned that on the hats, letter carriers would often wear badges. So I, I've seen some photos of some of these older badges and they're some of them are really beautiful. They're very ornate metal badges that have this identification number on them and sometimes some other like the city or the state where they're working. But you don't see them anymore. So what happened to them? Yeah, um, these are um, metal badges. Um, it's sort of a pin. Um, and initially when they came into being in the, um, the late 19th century, um, the idea was to try to cut down on fraud. Um, so each letter carrier would have um, an individual number um, and it would be recorded at the post office. So you'd have this metal badge that has your number. It might have the name of the city um, or the state. And um they, they, some of them were quite um, ornate, so you might have like a wreath style, so a badge that um, has the number and then like metal leaves surrounding it um, or some sort of um, like arabesque variation. Um, so letter carriers also had to purchase these badges at their own expense, um, but this was um, one of the few things that was required for both rural carriers and, um, and city carriers. Um, eventually, um, you know, the badges become less ornate, which is sort of a... Uh, a sample of um, like taste changing um, and, you know, just trying as a way to try to save money, um, just making them just making them less ornate. Um, but letter carriers have not had to wear a badge since 1982. It's just no longer um, in their required um, in their required uniforms. Are there are there other examples of of parts of the original postal uniforms that we no longer see today? Yes. Um, there used to be service stars to signify a carrier's length of service. Um, so after five years, um, you would get one black star that was worn on the uniform sleeve. After 10 years, it was two black stars. Um, and as a carrier's career progressed, um, they could receive red, silver, and gold stars depending on their tenure. So you've touched on how the uniforms have changed over time. What are some of the earliest changes that people would have seen? The strict attitudes toward uniforms did soften over time, however. Um, so carriers won a big victory in 1901 um, when they were permitted to wear a shirt without a jacket on hot days. Wow. Mm -hmm. Luxuries. Yes. Um, they had to wear um, specific fabrics. They were given um, a list of fabrics that they could wear, which were sort of lightweight cottons um, in a gray or a blue. Um, so this, um, as long as they kept their shirts neat um, and they still had to wear a tie and a belt, um, but they could do their work uh, in greater comfort depending on their location. What about shorts? Or did they stick with pants for a while? They stuck with pants for a very long time. Um, it was not until 1973 that letter carriers could wear shorts. Um, and this um, was brought up again and again, um, beginning kind of in the 1960s, um, as shorts in the American population became um, more acceptable for casual wear. Um, and you see people um, in them more frequently, which, again, really doesn't happen until like after the Second World War. So we've been talking a lot about mail carriers and the importance of having uniforms that the public can identify them. Um, but at the same time, we have other employees working at the post offices. Did that happen around the same time? I mean, did they, when did they start wearing uniforms, just like the mail carriers? 
It was a little bit more controversial because they weren't in the public eye. So you definitely had some push, some early pushback um, from postal clerks. Um, so, for instance, in 1877, um, which is going back quite a while, the New York postmaster wanted his postal clerks and superintendents to wear uniforms because um, he felt um, that it had been um, a good way to um, represent the post office to the public, um, and he thought it would help distinguish them from customers who were visiting the post office, um, as well as keeping unauthorized people out of the area where postal employees are working. Because just imagine people going in, if everyone's wearing the same thing, how do you know who works there? Um, so superintendents didn't really seem to have a problem with it, but clerks really objected. Um, they said that, why should they wear uniforms? The public rarely saw them. And honestly, um, it doesn't say this in the newspaper, article, but it probably had something to do with the cost of having to buy themselves new clothing, because if you've already got clothes you can wear, why do you want to buy new ones? Um, so to keep the peace, the postmaster backs down, uh, and the rule ends up applying to superintendents only. And you actually have um, a very similar story about um, 10 years later in Chicago, right at the turn of the century. The postmaster wanted his clerks to wear uniforms, um, and the clerks rebelled. Uh, apparently openly rebelled, and uh, this led to a number of public talks. And they said again, um, they were rarely seen in public. Um, and they actually pointed out that there were many women um, who worked as clerks who could not wear the livery anyways, because it would not have applied to women. Um, they Most of them worked without a coat on in their shirt sleeves, um, which is something that would have been considered fairly improper in the public. Um, so they wanted to be more comfortable. So we, we touched earlier uh, about how the rules at the time weren't really geared towards women wearing wearing uniforms. But as more and more women started working for the Postal Service, how did that impact uniforms? So it does take a while for women to sort of get their own uniforms, um, but it, it forces um, it forces some changes. Um, and we There were actually a lot of opportunities for women um, in ways that people might not expect. Um, there were plenty of women who worked outside of cities. Um, so if you were a rural delivery carrier, um, rural free delivery comes into being um, in 1896. Um, you know, women ran post offices. They might work as a carrier. Um, and girls did want to carry letters. Um, so for instance, um, in 1894, um, the situation for women uh, was sort of unfortunate. Um, there's a letter from a woman who wants to be a letter carrier. Um, the article sort of speculates um, on what women's uniforms might look like if she were a carrier. Um, and it's very focused on looks. Um, so the author imagines that a uniform for a blue-eyed, pink-cheeked blonde that's blue um, would be fairly charming. But for a sallow brunette, the article suggests something more pronounced in color. Um, and obviously, the point of a uniform isn't necessarily um, the same as what one might wear in their free time. Um, and we see a lot of comments like this surrounding women in, in uniforms. Um, but this does not deter them. That's Incredible. And it's amazing how far we've come since those days. I remember in our episode with Jenny Lynch about the history of women in the Postal Service, she mentioned that these early uniform requirements of pants, particularly for the city letter carriers, kind of prevented women at that time from working. Um, so I know you mentioned that a lot of them worked as rural carriers or in other functions within the Postal Service. Do you have any other stories of, of how women were able to overcome these um, barriers to their employment? Yes. Um, yeah, the the pants thing would have been a real issue for a very long time. Um, but um, one of my favorite articles um, and stories that I've seen um, comes from Louisville, Kentucky in 1902. Um, a woman who um, had been running a, um, a post office there, Miss Helen Kramer, um, was running a small post office um, and then pushed for a rural delivery route. Um, and she actually won that bid um, and earned the right um, to deliver mail along this rural route. Um, and to do this, even though she did not need a uniform, um, she actually made her own. She um, came up with a pattern um, and went out and bought the cloth and sewed it herself. Um, and she details in the article how difficult it was to find um, the right color cloth um, and the right fit. And the article, again, sort of suggests that if women want to um, become rural letter carriers, they could reach out to Miss Kramer for advice about their uniforms because there were no other real options. Do you know what her uniform that she made would have looked like? Would it have been a long skirt with the coat or something similar to that? Yes, um, it would have been um, a... Um, 
if you think about kind of the Gibson girl picture is like a blouse with sort of larger sleeves and then nipped in at the waist um, and then probably a long um, a long wool skirt of blue gray um, and I think a jacket over that as well and that tells me um, that she was a fairly talented seamstress um, to be able to make that pattern and do that tailoring herself um, so on top of um, taking care of her invalid mother and running this post office and doing this route she also had these other talents as well so did the uniform policy eventually change to accommodate women? It does eventually, yes. But it's not really um, until the 1960s when uniforms specifically for women start to come into being. So um, before before the 1960s, women would just buy men's uniforms and try to make them work, um, you know, either adjust them if they had to or just deal with them. But um I don't know if you, um, for any women listening, if you are trying to buy men's clothing and get those to fit, it's, you know, it's it's not necessarily uh, an easy one-to-one comparison. Um, so um, beginning um, in 1964, um, the post office forms a partnership with Natick Laboratories, which is a research facility where army uniforms were tested. Um, so they start doing quality control tests for postal uniforms as well. Um, and the specs they come up with are meant for manufacturers as well as postal employees um, to get good quality. And part of this partnership means they start testing uniforms specifically for women. Um, and in fact, um, there are newspaper articles and the post office even issues a press release in 1964 um, stating that there was going to be a fashion show um, showing off the women's, the new uniforms for women um, that are completely tailored and redesigned and, quote, practical as well as eye pleasing. Um, so we all mail, mail letter carriers and window clerks are also getting um, redesigned jackets and um, more comfortable um, uniforms at this point. But it's really the emphasis on on women's um on women's uniforms that they're pushing. Um, so um, this uh, involves slacks that are made for women and fitted for women, um, a skirt and a tailored shirt distinctly for women. So um, from that point on, um, you know, you see um, you see things that um, are for, for men and for women. Um, so um, for instance, jackets that are tailored, um, different hats for women, like the beret hat I mentioned earlier, even though that wasn't a huge hit. Um, in 1969, there is a pillbox hat meant for women. Um, and uh, by the 1970s, as I mentioned, um, everyone could wear Bermuda shorts. Um, so we, we continue to see changes. Um, perhaps one of the most significant changes is that in February of 1992, maternity wear becomes available. Um, so a long sleeve um, and short sleeve blouse, slacks and a jumper. And that is huge. Allison, you've mentioned that the Postal Museum has some uniform items in its collection Can you tell us a little bit more about what you guys are doing to bring this aspect of postal history to life? Yes. Um, So one way that we are hoping to expand upon what we already have um, is we're currently working on an oral history project that focuses on postal workwear. We want to document the experiences of current and past postal workers. And this isn't just letter carriers. You know, we're interested in anyone. Like, you don't have to wear a set uniform. Um, We're also interested in speaking with um, manufacturers and producers um, and um, thinking about things of – thinking about issues like how workwear is designed and how it's produced, um, how it's selected, um, how workers choose and adapt clothing to fit their daily needs. Um, So also not just talking about clothing, but what it's like to wear um, workwear or the uniform. Um, And ideally, we'd love to get um, a really um, diverse group of people for this project. So it's something that um, is just sort of getting off the ground. We've been working on it um, during the the pandemic. Um, so that's obviously made uh, interacting with people difficult. Um, but um, yes, that is that is something that um, we've been working on um, in partnership with the um, costume studies program at NYU, actually. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing how all that pans out. Allison, before we wrap the episode up, um, Last question. What do you think is the future of postal uniforms? Uh, will it get more casual, for example? I think so. Um, you know, I, I it isn't something that I am privy to, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but um, I think the general trend uh, in clothing has certainly become more casual. And I think there's there's really an emphasis on um, functionality and comfort um, that we didn't used to see, which is, seems like a positive thing, right? You're out carrying huge bags of letters. 
I can only imagine there's been a lot of developments in fabric technology since the days of the wool three-piece suits. So hopefully they can get some great sweat wicking materials and improve their comfort. Oh, that'd be great. Yes, definitely. Um, you know, whatever is introduced next, um, I'm sure they will keep reflecting what's relevant in society. Um, and I would love to see, you know, 100 years from now what we'll be talking about um, in terms of what people are wearing and, and how that represents a changing postal service. Allison, I've really enjoyed this conversation, but I understand for our listeners, it might be a little difficult to um, get that mental image of some of these uniforms. So we're actually planning on uh, putting out a blog post uh, from the podcast itself on postal uniforms, where the audience is going to be able to actually see the images, styles, accessories covered uh, covered here with us today. Great. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that, too, um, because I think... Yes, with clothing, you know, I can describe it or people can describe it, but you, I always want to see images and I, I hope, hopefully listeners do as well. Listeners can also visit the National Postal Museum here in Washington, D.C. One of my favorite museums. Allison, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, it's time for Did You Know? This is a chance for us to share some interesting details about the Postal Service that most people probably don't know. Yasmin, would you like to take lead on this one? Sure. Let's throw it back almost 20 years to early 2003. You thought I was going to say the 90s, but (laughs) 2003 was 20 years ago. The term podcast was more than a year away from being coined. MP3 players were just catching on. And CDs were still the main way of listening to all of the great new music coming out. Oh my gosh, simpler times. It really was. And one of the new CD releases that year was from a group that had an interesting name. Let me guess, you're talking about the band The Postal Service, right? That's right. The indie pop trio released their debut album that February. Its upbeat electronic lead single, Such Great Heights, spent 11 weeks on the Hot 100 chart and enjoyed enduring popularity throughout the mid-2000s. And what a great song. Yeah, well, the United States Postal Service wasn't so enthusiastic. In August of 2003, they sent a cease and desist letter citing the band name as an infringement on its trademark. Eventually, though, USPS gave in and allowed them to use the name in exchange for promotional efforts and a performance at its annual National Executive Conference. Oh, man, that must have been a cool conference. So were the members big fans of the Postal Service? How'd that name come about? Well, its two main members were already busy performers when they formed. Singer Ben Gibbard with the indie band Death Cab for Cutie and producer Jimmy Tamborello with his electronic music project, Dintel. Since they couldn't always get together in person, they would often collaborate on tracks by sending audio tapes back and forth through the United States Postal Service. Okay, so another unique way to use the Postal Service. Uh, I think it's my turn. I'm going to riff off of one of your previous did you knows and segue into mine. You know, over the years, the Postal Service has helped people transport a whole host of odd items, things you still can't send digitally. We talked in an earlier episode about how some people actually mailed children during the first few years of Parcel Post Service. This time, I want to talk to you about a chameleon. A chameleon? Yep. In December of 1954, the postmaster in Orlando, Florida, received a letter stating, Dear Sir, I'm sending you my chameleon because I live in Fastoria, Ohio, and it's too cold for him here. Will you please let him loose? P.S. Could you let me know if he arrives okay? Aw, did he make it? (laughs) He did. The sender got a letter back shortly after from the postmaster informing him that his lizard did indeed survive the journey and that he had been immediately released on post office grounds. That's cute. That's also got to be one of the strangest things ever mailed. It's honestly a close competition when you look at history. One guy actually mailed part of a building through the Postal Service. You mean a model of a building? No, I mean an actual building. In 1916, a businessman decided to build a new bank in Vernal, Utah. He wanted to use the best materials, so he had 15,000 bricks mailed in 50-pound packages from the Salt Lake Pressed Brick Company, 127 miles from Vernal. I feel bad for the mail carrier on that route. Well, as you can imagine, mailing tons of bricks to a small post office caused a lot of problems. Although about 37 and a half tons of bricks were eventually delivered, the issue was escalated to the Postmaster General at the time. 
He and his staff modified the rules to limit the total weight of parcel post that could be shipped in one day. Well, do you think you can still mail chameleons? I actually do know the Postal Service can handle some forms of live animals, so maybe. Hmm. We'll have to look into that. (laughs) Well, that does it for this edition of Did You Know? Dale, what did you think about our conversation with Allison? I thought it was a great conversation. Wonderful, wonderful guest. But um, I'll be honest, it's going to sound childish. I really like the idea of letter carriers wearing capes. <laughs> In all seriousness, though, the uh, the idea of service stars was interesting. With me personally being with the Postal Service for nearly 10 years, I can admit that I'm excited to hit that service milestone for myself. And I'm sure it's the same for our mail carriers. It's a sense of pride. Might be something to consider for the future. How about you? I could see that. For me, I, I really enjoyed hearing about how the uniforms have changed with the times, and especially these stories of women being innovative with their uniforms to work for the USPS. I wouldn't say no to a reversible cape, though. <laughs> Maybe we could get them to bring those back. I like it. Well, that wraps up this episode of Mail in It. Don't forget to subscribe to Mail in It wherever you get your podcasts to make sure you don't miss the next episode. And follow along on Instagram, at US Postal Service, Twitter, at USPS, and on Facebook.